God is worthy to be praised. Amen? Amen. 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 Great. Uh, God is worthy to be praised. Uh, morning, church. It's great to have you all this morning. And it's also good to uh, have those online who are joining us. Um, and it's really good just to be together. So let's just pray. Uh, and Father, now we just pray as we have prayed early on that you would draw us to yourself. Father, will you not open our minds and our hearts, Lord, to the, the wonderful truths of your word. Father, we just pray that you'd have a, a real sense of your, your presence and your holiness as we tackle this issue of temptation. Lord, we all face all sorts and kinds of, of temptations day and night. And Father, we pray that your word would speak into the lives, into our lives, as we just draw near to you. And so, Father, we pray that you'd draw us to yourself. We pray all of this in your precious name. Amen. Amen. We're in our series, uh, uh, Faith That Works. We're looking at different aspects of how uh, our faith works out. We've looked at uh, trials and tests. And this morning we're going to look on again at, uh, at uh, um, temptations. Uh, folk at the back, just can fix up at the top there. It's off, if you don't mind. Uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, Marcus Antonius, better known as Mark Anthony, was the famous uh, uh, Roman statesman from 83 to 30 BC, a supporter of Julius Caesar, and eventually one of the three great rulers of the empire. This silver tongue orator could sway the, the masses like no other man of his day. Not only was he a dynamic a speaker, but also had the cunning of a, a, a great general and, and brilliant thinker. Yet his military and intellectual skills lacked the power to conquer his moral weakness. In fact, his exasperated tutor, frustrated at the fact that a, such a, a gifted young youth would be spoiled by moral failure, shouted in his face, O oh Marcus, O oh colossal childs, able to conquer the worlds, but unable to resist temptation. There are certainly many Mark Anthony's Christians who have education, who have Bible knowledge, who have inspiring uh, examples of, of people who have overcome temptation. And then also the, the sober warnings of, of those who have given in to temptation and experienced moral failure. And yet, how many we know that have plunged headlong into temptation, facing disaster at, at work, at home, families are broken up, and then even at church. As somebody put it, temptation knows no limits, it respects no title, it plays no favorites, it ignores all human obstacles, cares nothing about the time of, of day or night, and camouflages itself in any situation, prepared to, to pounce at any moment. Temptation has many faces, stealing, lying, lust, gossiping, cheating, envying, striving for popularity, vying for power. The list is certainly endless. John White, the author, reminds us of the inevitability of temptation. He writes and says the following, you will be tempted. The kinds of temptation may change. Candies for kids, sensuality for the young, riches for the middle-aged, and power for the aging. The evil one can ring the changes with greater skill than any advertising agency. He knows the killy hill of every microbe. You will be tempted continuously. You will be tempted ferociously at times of crisis. Jesus himself was tempted in all points as we are. That is to commit adultery, to steal, to lie, to kill, and on and on. Yet without sin. Therefore temptation itself need not dismay you. It was your Savior's lot, and it will be yours. As long as you live, 
you will be tempted. And as Charles Ryrie in his book, Balancing the Christian Life, catalogues a list of biblical people who were involved with temptation. Remember Noah's drunkenness, or Abram's cowardice and lying before a heathen ruler, or Moses' self-examination, which made him strike the self-exaltation, that made him strike the rock and kept him out of the promised land, or Jacob's stratagems, or the patriarch's mistreatment of Joseph, or Elijah's murmuring, or David's double sin, or Hezekiah's ostentations, or Jonah's rebellious spirit, or Peter's denial of his, word, of his Lord, or John Mark's defection, or Paul and Barnabas' strife. Some of the noblest men and women of the Bible have not only experienced temptation, but have yielded to its power. In six short verses, James sets forth the, the truth about temptation, exploring the, the other meaning of this little Greek word that we looked at last week, that, that word parasmos. In verse 2 to, to 12, that Greek word parasmos refers to the outward trials or, or tests that we experienced. We, we looked at it last week. And then in verse 15, uh, 13 to 15, he, he speaks about the, the inner temptations that we face on a daily basis. We discovered that tests come from God and they're meant to help us grow up uh, into spiritual steadfastness. And that Satan comes from, uh, temptation comes from Satan at least to cause us to sin. When facing trials, we are to journey with them. Listen to this. When we face trials, we are, are meant to journey with that trial, that test. And as James says in verse 2, to count it all joy. But friends, when we face temptation, we are to flee them and renounce them. Now rather than skimming over the surface like many Bible teachers and, and preachers tend to do, James probes below the surface to reveal the inner workings of temptation. Like a doctor with a, a scalpel, James takes a look at temp the temptation's origin, the options, the outcome, and the overcoming. Let's turn to James chapter 1 and verse 13 to 18 in your Bibles. We'll turn to James chapter 1 and verse 13. I'm going to be reading from the ESV. James chapter 1 and verse 13. James begins, verse 13. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then, verse 15, then desire when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So far we'll read in verse in, the, in, in James, in the Word of God. She was immensely attractive. I'll never forget the, that night. I was 25 years old. We were at young adults, and uh, when it was time to go home, which you all got to do when young adult from church, from the church uh, group. Uh, I had a car, and she needed a lift. Uh, she was a, a new girl in our young adults, and as she asked me for a lift, I obliged. Um, and like a good young person, I, I drove her home. And when I got to the, the front door of her flat, 
Uh, she asked me, would I like to come up for coffee? And of course, like young people do, you always care until the early hours of the morning. And that's what happened. But eventually, it was time to go home. And as I got up, uh, I'll never forget it, uh, in a, uh, a bachelor flat, uh, she looked me in the eye and made it very plain that I could stay the night and, and, and do whatever. Temptation is, temptation lurks at every corner, day and night. And this brings us firstly to point number one, the, the origin of our temptation. The origin of our temptation, verse 13 and 14. Temptation is always around like tests of faith. Temptations are inevitable. There is no spiritual vaccine, no get-out-of-temptation-free card, no alternate route to avoid the traps along the trial, the trail. The aging monk in the mo monastery is no safer than the young man at the mall. The saint in prayer wrestles with temptation just as the salesman who travels around in his Porsche. James, at this point, is, is absolutely emphatic. James wants to make a point in this passage because, like most people, we, we like to pass the buck. It's amazing what excuse I've heard over the years as a pastor when, when people have fallen into temptation. Sometimes you might smile and laugh, but actually it's not so funny at all. Amazing excuses. We, we might try and sound spiritual. I'll never forget uh, our maid. We caught us uh, 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 stealing nappies, those uh, nappies you buy at checkers or pick and pay. And I never forget the, the response she, she gave us. The devil made me do it. It sounds so spiritual. C.S. Lewis, the great intellectual, once said, The devil doesn't mind if we are totally obsessed with him or if we ignore him completely. In other words, we believe that he actually doesn't exist. We might try and sound spiritual, or maybe we will defer to psychology. I'm sure you've heard this excuse. It's, it's my parents' fault. It's, it's my poor upbringing. My personal circumstances have, have led me into this situation. We might use the sociological argument. An excuse as old as it gets. In fact... It came from the garden, the, the garden of Gethsemane. Sorry, the garden of Eden, not Gethsemane. The garden of Eden. The woman you gave me, she made me do it. Tried that one? Or maybe it's the husband. Or the worst of the lot, the, sometimes we try and provide a, a theological argument. Since God is sovereign... He could have stopped me. Therefore, God is to blame. Ever tried that? James says to us, stop right there, verse 13. Let no one say, when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. The Greek is emphatic at this point, and the ESV correctly translates, let no one, or as one of the other translations says, let no man say. You see, God's goodness and His holiness are your and my guarantee. To be holy means to be set apart from evil. God can never be tempted, and God will never ever tempt anyone. The origin of our temptation is never God, but rather our inward desires, our lusts, our, our human nature, our fallen nature, those sinful lusts that seem to, to lurk within us. The origin is our own desires, James reminds us. And then this leads me to the second point, the order of temptation. Now, 
Temptation always follows a four-stage process. You, you need to know this. It's important. And James gives us the, these four stages and, and three vivid pictures in this passage. The first stage, as James points out, is desire. Da James puts in view our own personal desires. Verse 14, but each people, a person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. We all have desires, feelings, God-given desires, hunger and sex and anger over wrong and the desire for wealth and significance and, and self-worth. The big question this morning is, is how do we handle those desires and, and feelings that we, we have within us? As Viersby put it, a temptation is an opportunity to obtain a good thing in a bad or a, a sinful way out of the will of God. Eve saw the forbidden fruit. Achan saw the, the spoils of war. David, as he looked out over his porch, he, he saw this attractive, beautiful, naked woman, Bathsheba. And the godly man Job, because of what we see and the danger of it, he, he made a, a commitment to God in Job 31 verse 1. I have made a, a covenant with my eyes that I might not look lustfully at a girl. Now, of course we know that this doesn't cover just the opposite sex, whether it's a man or a woman. As Billy Graham aptly put it, the first look is free, but the second will, will cost you. James begins in, in verse 14 with a contrast word, that, that word, but. Temptation, he says, doesn't start with God, who cannot tempt or be tempted, but, James says, but, with our inner desires or lusts, we alone are capable, we are responsible. And of course the question is, how are we handling those inner desires? Are we handling them in a, in a godly way? First, our desires, that's the first stage. The, the second one is the deception. Verse 14, the second part. Each person is tempted when he is lured, in the other words, and enticed by his own desires. Now let me say this morning that no temptation looks like a temptation. And, and, and James uses two pictures, two illustrations. The, the first is a, a fishing illustration. Now I don't know how many fishermen are here. How many of you guys are fishermen or ladies even? Any fishermen? In my two churches back, everybody were fishermen. We lived on the coast. It was amazing. But I ask that all raise their hands and say we're getting charismatic. But anyway... Uh, but I had a neighbor, uh, and one day he told me about, uh, he caught a, a, a fish, a cobble yo. Now usually they're small. This guy brought, uh, caught a, a great-grandfather. It was 16 kilos. All you can do with that sort of fish is pickle it because it's, 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 it's really tough meat. Um, but I asked him how did he do it, and he said, well, he, he threw in or cast the lure and no fish goes knowingly for the lure. The lure is dropped into our lives. And deep inside, something happens within our hearts. And we take it line, hook, and sinker. The second graphic illustration is, is that of trapping a, a wild uh, animal. Scripture says we, we are deceived and, and drawn away from our own desires. There is this deception. Going back to the fish, if you think of it, it comes out of its safe spot and goes for that colorful lure. And friends, we, we're safe until we, we see this thing dangling before us. And we get out of safety and, and we grab, we, we go for it. There is deception. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the courageous German theologian put to death by the Nazis for taking a stand against Hitler's evil regime, 
articulates this process of, of temptation as clearly as I've ever heard it explained. In our members, there is a, a slumbering inclination towards desire, which is both sudden and fierce. With irresistible power, desire seizes mastery over the flesh. The flesh bl uh, 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 burns and is in flames. It makes no difference if it is sexual desire or ambition or vanity or desire for revenge or love of fame and power or greed for money or finally that strange desire for the beauty of the world of nature. Joy in God is in course of being extinguished in us. And we seek all our joy in the creature. At this moment, God is quite, and listen to this, at this moment, God is quite unreal to us. He loses all reality, and the only desire for the creature is real. The only reality is the devil. Satan does not yet fill us with a hatred for God, but with a forgetfulness of God. Isn't that true? That moment we, we lunge in temptation, we, we forget all about our Christian testimony and about God himself and the reality and presence of God in our lives. Desire, deception, and thirdly, disobedience, verse 15. James begins verse 15 with a word that in, uh, indicates progression. Then, the first part of verse 15, then he says, Desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. Now, James uses a, a vivid picture, conception. The temptation has now become pregnant with sin. It's very interesting, but the Greek word conception is made up of two parts, which means to take together. James focuses his microscope on the two necessary ingredients, the colorful lure we spoke about earlier on, and the internal desire that lusts in our hearts. And together, temptation is hatched and sin is born. King David illustrates this in a, a radical, radical way, and I want to quote uh, Chuck Sundol at this point. King David illustrates James chapter 1, 14 to 15, he says, in a, in a radical way. While his armies were out fighting, David stayed in Jerusalem, lounging and lingering at his palace, 2 Samuel 11 verse 1. Had he been with, with his army where he was supposed to be, he could have avoided the downward plunge into immorality. But instead of waging physical war on the battlefield, David fought a, a spiritual war against temptation, and he lost. It started out innocently enough. As he meandered on the palace roof, the, the king's wandering eyes caught a woman bathing. Verse 2. This accidental glance was not in itself a sin, but mixed with David's restless urges, the unintentional glance quickly became a willful uh, stare. Remember what I said about Billy Graham? The first look is free, but the second is going to cost you. He noticed she was very beautiful, verse 2. The focus of his gaze and his internal desires conceived a powerful temptation that few men in David's position could have resisted. Like a victim dro dropping through a trap door, David's plunge from temptation to sin followed in a, a breakneck progression. He inquired about her, verse 3. He sent, to her, verse, he sent for her, verse 4, and he slept with her, verse 4, all the while knowing she was Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. David's sin didn't end with adultery. His immorality turned to a desperate attempt to cover up, leading ultimately to two deaths. 
The death of, U of Uriah the Hittite and the death of his son, the product of his one night stand. 2 Samuel 11, 5 to 12, verse 14. From last to death, David's temptation becomes a, a textbook example of temptation and sexual lust. Almost as if he took the slippery slope of sin in James chapter 1, verses 14 and 15 as a script. The most frightening thing about David's sin is that it happened, listen to this, it happened to a man who's described as the man after God's own heart. 1 Samuel 13, 14. If such a, a great man of God could, can fall so suddenly and so severely, we shouldn't think for a moment that it can't happen to us. That's the bad news about temptation. And something I want to add, I wasn't planning to. I remember in our first year, our principal, Peter Holness, he told us as students to, to write down, you as a pastor, if you think you can never be tempted by a woman or somebody in your congregation, then write down no on that piece of paper. And if it's yes, it's possible, you write a yes, and we all scribble down our answers. And then he got up and he said, after he'd written down, he said to us, those of you who've said no, who think you, you can't be tempted, you are at a greater danger than the people who said yes. Desires, deception, disobedience, and the fourth word finally is death. This leads us to point number three in our notes. We've had the origin, where it comes from, the, the options, those four steps. And then the outcome of your temptation. Verse 15b, the outcome of your temptation. James writes, verse 15, Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And here it is. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Now, we need to linger over this word, Death. Don't miss, miss the progression. When the, an allurement carries us away, we move into the realm of temptation. We allow a temptation, to, when we allow a temptation to linger, we eventually sin. And when sin continues without repentance, listen carefully, without repentance, it will lead to that horrible word, death. You are free to choose the actions, but not the results. You are free to enjoy the kicks, but not avoid the, the kickbacks. You are free to make the choices, but not avoid the consequences. What is this death that James is, is speaking about? Is it a physical death? Well, well certainly... Some have died premature deaths from drug addiction and alcoholism and the like. But if that were true, I want to say this morning that all of us would be dead. Is it spiritual death? Certainly some who have been caught up with sin, so much so that they, they can never turn to God. But of course we know that works do not save us. What then is... James talking about, we, we need to understand the, the Jewish thinking of the day. To be dead was more a way of life than a, a destination. Remember Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 15, it says the following. Moses is addressing in his final sermon to the people of Israel, the children of Israel. He's addressing them and he calls them to make a, a choice. And right at the end, in, in the application of his sermon, he says the following. See, I have set before you life and prosperity and death and destruction. I want to ask you this morning, where are you? Are you experiencing the, the life and prosperity that, that God desires for you? The smile of God on your life? Or death and destruction and adversity? As temptation conceives in your life, 
and it gives birth to sin. And friends, sin gives birth to consequences. I want to say one of the most difficult parts of, of pastoral ministry is picking up the mess when, when people have, have given in to temptation and their lives are devastated and families are devastated and I can go on and on. Where are you today? That's the question James asks us. We've looked at the origin, the options, the outcome. But friends, finally there's good news. Number four, the overcoming of your temptation. The good news is that any, uh, and listen to this, any temptation can be resisted. You can resist the desire, you can repulse the bait, you can retrace your strip, uh, steps, and you can retract the process. You, friend, Christian, can live in victory. Let me say it again. You can overcome and yes, you can live in victory. The Apostle Paul encourages us in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. I remember this verse was, was drummed into us at Sunday School. Now, I hope our Sunday School is, is getting your kids to, to memorize Scripture because I've never forgotten this verse. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Maybe turn in your Bibles and underline it. It's such an important verse. 1 Corinthians 10, 10 verse 13. No temptation, Paul says, has seized you except what is common to man. In other words, our temptation isn't uh, any different or any worse than somebody else's temptation. And God is faithful. Listen to that. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, and take note, you will be tempted. When you're tempted, he will also provide a way out so you can stand up under it. Isn't that encouraging? Amen. How can you rise above temptation? How can you turn temptations into triumphs? Verse 16, James reminds us, do not... Be deceived, my brothers and my sisters. In other words, don't be misled by foolish thinking. Don't give in to temptation. In the final two verses, James gives us the, the source of victory, which is God himself. Verse 17 and 18. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will, he brought us forth by a word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Number one, number one, remind yourself of God's goodness. God provides us with the means of victory over the temptations of life. The one who creates the things good and perfect is the one who brought you forth by a word of truth, who has saved you, who has converted you, who has changed you. Friends, if God can transform your life, if you can be a new creation, surely he can help you overcome that, that temptation that comes your way. Victory comes when we focus on the good things of God you know, you can't harbor evil thoughts when you're focusing on the, the good things of God. When you're focusing on God, let me say it again, you cannot be thinking other things that you, sh thinking, uh, that sh that you shouldn't be thinking about. It is absolutely impossible. Paul addresses this in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8. And he says, as he concludes this letter, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble... Whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, what does it say? Think about these things. What are you listening to? What are you, what are you looking at? What are you focusing on? What do you watch? Because Paul reminds us this, this great biblical truth that what goes in your head is going to come out. 
And if you're watching filth on TV, or you're looking at pornography, or you're looking at things you shouldn't, you're going to get yourself into trouble, Christian. It's just a matter of time. Victory comes when you focus on the good things of God. And victory comes by, by living the truth. Verse 18, James says, the NASB says, we have been brought forth by a word of truth. When those appealing, luscious temptations, and let me tell you, sin can be lots of fun. When those temptations come, God's word can literally deliver you from, from sin and from temptation. David knew this and he, he wrote it in Psalm 119, verse 9 to 11, another verse we should know. How can a, a young man keep his way pure? By what? By living according to your word, the Bible. David says, verse 10 of Psalm 119, I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have treasured your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Brother or sister in Christ, are you treasuring God's word? And hopefully you're going through, through James at the moment. Do you only now and then dabble in the word? Or are you immersing yourself, allowing it to search your mind and cleanse your heart? We need to remind ourselves of God's goodness. And then secondly, in application, we need to recognize those four steps of temptation, verses 14 and 15. The first thing is this. You need to define your unmet desire. What is your unmet need in your heart? What is the, the godly way of, of meeting that need? Paul told, uh, told the Romans in Chapter 13, verse 14, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. Make no provision for all those temptations and, and sin. Not only must we not focus on that temptation, but we need to replace it with something else. And your study, hopefully you would have picked it up in that study, the James study. Not only must we avoid temptation, but we, we need to replace it with, with something else. The key is filling our minds with other things. Instead of resisting, refocus. You see, the more you, you fight a feeling, the more it grabs you. Is that true? The more you try to get away from it, the, the more it seems to come your way. The more it grabs you. What you... Resist tends to persist. We, we need to refocus. Flee, flee the evil desires of your youth, Paul said to Timothy, 2 Timothy 22, and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call out on the Lord out of a pure heart. In other words, what Paul is saying is leave that behind and, and replace and refocus. And may I add at this point, it is better to be hungry in the will of God than to be full outside of the will of God. Define your unmet need. And then the second one, detect the deception. How is Satan trying to, to trap you or to bring you down? What dark cave is, is Satan leading you into? What shortcut is he, is he offering? What desire is he trying to fill in a, in, a, in a sinful way? There's a story of a man who once purchased a new car. He ignored the dealer's instructions to, to check the oil. And hopefully you, you check your oil from time to time. I'm usually in a rush at the petrol station and I leave it for a few times. But hopefully you're not like me and you check the oil and after a year, he, he began to smell, a, 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 there was a smell of, of burning oil, and, and then a strange hollow sound of, of the engine. 
He had no, long ignored the, the irritating yellow warning light on his dashboard and he covered it up with a piece of, of black electrical tape and didn't, didn't see it when it went from orange to red. And didn't know why his shiny car rolled to a stop and refused to start. What warnings, what flashing lights are you ignoring lately in your life? Uh, maybe a, a verse of scripture, perhaps a, a sermon that has been preached about temptation, a probing question from your spouse who wonders where you've been, maybe the cry of your child, or the passing comment from a colleague at work. Andy Stanley tells a story of a time when a, uh, he and a friend, impulsive teens, decided to take a, a shortcut on an incomplete interstate highway, and they eased their car between the words road and closed, and they gunned it. Fortunately, they were stopped by a good Samaritan before an unfinished bridge that would have sent them off the side of a cliff. Sometimes you are too smart for those warning signs. There are warning signs before the deep cave called immorality and sin. Many enter, but I want to say this morning that none emerged, none emerge without injuries. In bold red letters, the scripture warns do not enter, do not enter, do not enter. Friends, detect the deception and then defy the disobedience. Defy the disobedience. Use that Joseph method, focus and flee. Look stri straight and run like the sprinter does and you just go for it. And you run that 100 meters in, in less than the world's record of 9 point something seconds. Genesis 39 verse 7 now Joseph, it says, the text says, was well built and handsome. And after a while, his master's wife took notice of him and said to him, come to bed with me. Joseph's response, how can I dishonor my boss? And more importantly, how can I sin against God? Because that's what sin is. It's ultimately against God. Why was Joseph so strong the simple reason is this, this man was walking with God. And you would have picked this up hopefully if you haven't already in your Bible study of James where they quote Matthew 26, 41 where Jesus says to his disciples, watch and pray. And very pertinently, the, the writer of that study, she says, she asks the question, when is the time to pray? It's long before the temptation happens that we watch and pray and prepare our hearts and walk with God because that will keep you from temptation. Focus and flee. Defy the disobedience and finally discern the costs. When you come out of that cave called sin, what is life going to look like? What will that temptation cost you? What will that temptation cost your family? What will that temptation cost your, your children? What will that temptation cost your, your work and your relationships? I want to say to you, I've, I've, I've been involved with many heart-rendering situations in families and so on because of this very issue. A wise sage said, Sub a thought and you reap an act. Sow an act and you reap a habit. Sow a habit and you reap a character. Sow a character and you reap a destiny. In closing part two of the story I shared earlier on, my mother, she's now in glory, was a, a godly woman and very importantly, a, a woman of prayer, and I believe, and I heard about this afterwards, that God himself woke her up, and she began to pray 
for her son. Back at that flat, that beautiful, attractive young woman, and as I stood there, it was time to make a decision. Nobody would know. Nobody was watching a nice, comfortable flat with a, a great temptation. But you know, it was time to make a decision. And I believe the Holy Spirit, and I, I believe this as I look back on my life, that at important junctures, I was in my second year of college, that at important junctures, I can see God's hand and His Spirit on my life. And instead of that three-letter S-E-X word, we sat down to pray that we would honor God. Friends, we, we need to resist temptation. We need to resist in, in the power of God and His Spirit. But we need to commit ourselves to be there. Let us pray. Father, as we bow before you this morning, and it's been a long sermon, Lord, we recognize that day by day we are assaulted by temptations that are designed by Satan to destroy our, our faith and our, our testimony. Lord, we bow before you, recognizing that you have died on a cross to forgive our sins, Lord, to, to free us from bondages and to lead us into freedom. Lord, we reflect on the words of Colossians 2, verses 13 to 15. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Father, this morning we thank you that we can celebrate the fact that you have overcome sin. You have triumphed over sin. And Lord, you offer us forgiveness and, and power to overcome. And so Lord, we bow before you. And we ask you to strengthen us. We ask you to forgive us. And Lord, we ask you to free us from the bondages of sin, the condemnation, the guilt we experience even now. And oh God, we just reflect on Romans 8, 1 and 2. Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. I first want to pray for those who perhaps or in bondage, who are suffering guilt. I want to say this morning that Jesus convicts us of sin, but he, he calls us back to himself. But Satan condemns you and says to you, you, you filthy sinner, God will never want you back. And that's a lie. Why don't you come to Lord Jesus this morning if you, you are holding pain in your heart. And so, Lord Jesus, I want you to free me from the things I've messed up, the, the sin I've committed. Why don't you ask Jesus right now to, to help you overcome? And then maybe there's some this morning who are dealing with temptation. Perhaps it's pornography. Perhaps it's anger and, and wanting to get even with somebody else. Maybe it's adultery or sex outside of sin. And young people at a young age... That temptation comes all the time to mess around when you shouldn't be. Won't you determine today to end that, that pornography, whatever else it might be, that greed of taking advantage of people for money and so on, if you're in that position. Won't you confess it right now and say, Lord, I want you to strengthen me. And then for each one this morning, Jesus says to us, watch and pray. And as it was pointed out in the James Manual, the time to pray is not when you face the temptation or after the temptation. The time to pray is right now. Father God, we want to pray. We want to commit ourselves afresh to you. Lord, we pray first for healing and overcoming of those who, who wallow in guilt and, and condemnation.
Father, won't you remind them that at the cross you have overcome her. Lord, for those who, who face temptation or are involved in sin, Lord, we ask now that you would cut off that root of evil. Lord, help them to flee and to replace. Won't you make that commitment right now? And Lord, for all of us, Father, we want to pray for your spirit to, to strengthen us. Lord, to make us steadfast. And Father, help us to be victorious, to, to replace temptations with triumphs. We pray this all in your wonderful, holy, and precious name. Amen.